Hi, in this video I'm going to help you prepare to pass the Lightning Experience Reports and Dashboards Specialist Super Badge, say that 10 times fast, with confidence. If you're like me, when you first looked at this, you're like, oh my goodness, there is so much stuff here. How in the world am I going to make sense of this? In this video, I will break down all of these requirements that come up into easy to follow steps. And at the end of this, you will be able to go through the Lightning Experience. I don't want to say that whole thing again with a lot of confidence. In this video, I'm going to follow the same approach that I used in the Security Specialist Super Badge. I'm going to break up the user stories in a bit of a different way. And I'm also going to be sprinkling a little bit more advice throughout the business requirements about different resources that I used that Trailhead, you know, makes available for us and how they helped me along the way of understanding how to solve each one of the different challenges. The Security Specialist Super Badge got some amazing feedback, which I'm so grateful for everybody. You'll notice I comment on every single comment. I even got feedback from Jeff Douglas, who actually is like one of the authors of the Super Badge, which I thought that was really cool. And he said, really good video. We intentionally write this Super Badge in a manner as this is what you might get from a client. Great way to break it down. And you know what, like if you get, if sometimes I feel like if a client were to give you all this stuff in such a confusing way, like maybe you don't want to work with that client. But I understand what Jeff is trying to get out here is that they're trying to be a little bit confusing in order for you to be able to decipher what actually needs to happen. Also got some amazing feedback from people on LinkedIn, which I'm so grateful for. If you would like to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I just please, you know, mention a little comment and say how you came across me, love to connect and love to be able to track your career and you know answer any questions that I can for you too. If you're studying to become a Salesforce administrator, the process that I'm gonna show you in this video is gonna be a really helpful skill for you to have throughout your career. And if you go about and actually do and make up your own presentation and, and sort of your own documentation and do what I'm doing in this video, if you do your own version of that for yourself, that will make a really powerful story for your blog that you could then show to a prospective business that you're gonna be working with or trying to get hired into. While I'm at that topic, I, I've talked about blogs a little bit before, but I wanna talk about it a little bit more in depth now because if you're following the Salesforce administrator trail mix, you're almost done with the information required to start studying for your Salesforce administrator credential. So it's time to start thinking about how you're gonna be presenting yourself and getting ready to get your first job. And a good blog is a key component of helping to make that happen. When you apply to become a Salesforce administrator, everybody else who's applying for it is also gonna be a Salesforce administrator. So you need to find a way to stand apart from the crowd. There's two ways that people typically do this, either a portfolio or a blog. And a portfolio usually shows what you've done and a blog shows here's how to do something by the way if you're thinking that the best way to get experience is to volunteer at a nonprofit please read this blog post first i'll have a link to it in the description too right now you already know enough to create a bunch of really interesting blog posts that will demonstrate your knowledge and the way you'll do that is just you'll go sign up for a developer edition org and actually solve some of those business challenges that you already know how to solve. One of the really cool things you could also do is find a business that you had a negative interaction with and volunteer for them and say, here's how they could fix their problem and begin using Salesforce. I always think about this whenever I call Apple support. It's very frustrating to me. Like, you know which products I have because you know my Apple ID. I've told it to you. I've signed in with my account. Why can you not pull up my products? You should be able to do this. The most important thing though is, is that your blog is a reflection of your brand. And if you're new to business, this is something that's really important to appreciate. Your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And almost all of the important decisions in your working career are gonna be made by other people when you're not in the room to get hired, that's gonna be made by other people and you're not gonna be in the room where that happens. To get your promotion, you're not gonna be in the room where that happens. So your brand is, what do people think about you 
And what do they say about you when you're not there? And the best way to build your brand is by just being the awesome person that you are, but also being you, which brings me to a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. I see a lot of people who are new in the Salesforce ecosystem and they want to create a portfolio or a blog. And so what they do is they sign up for developer edition, they get the community page and they fill it with all of the Astro and friends. And what ends up happening is they look just like every other person who's brand spanking new to the Salesforce ecosystem. And this is a really big problem because A, you're not looking different from anybody else, but more importantly, you're not being you. You didn't just like get born and then start working to become a Salesforce administrator. You had probably a life and experiences before that. And that life and experiences before that is what's gonna make you so valuable because you have your experiences. Were you a teacher beforehand? Well, you probably know about being able to see past people's emotions and focus on what's important. You've probably sat in conversations, maybe with parents and had some difficult conversations. You've done that. Those are great business skills to bring into work. Did you manage a grocery store? Well, you know what it's like to manage employees and products and shelves. You could be sympathetic for other people in retail because you've been there. Were you a health coach? You know what it's like to work with people on their specific challenges and talk them through them and get them past them. You know how to explain things. All of those skills that you have are really valuable. And when you just use a generic community page and fill it with Astro and friends, you're not showing anything that's unique about you. Something else to keep in mind is there are companies that are using Salesforce, but don't have a great experience with it. And that's typically because the installation wasn't done well and problems. If you get hired at that company, you do not want to be the Salesforce person because they don't like Salesforce. The person hiring you might be like, we gotta fix our Salesforce, but the rest of the people in the company might not be excited about Salesforce. So you don't wanna come in or, or brand yourself as the Salesforce person. You wanna be the I solve business problems person. And yeah, I use Salesforce. And that's a completely different positioning and people will gravitate to you. What, you could solve this problem? You can make you know this approval go faster? You could solve this security issue? we're facing. You can create a report or a dashboard that's going to give us information about what new products to make. Whoa, that's really interesting. We like you. There's a lot of choices that you have in terms of which products you actually want to end up using to actually blog. My recommendation is using Ghost. Ghost is a super easy to use platform for blogging and creating content. And it has the ability for you to actually become long term a really powerful content creator. In the short term, there's got lots of different themes that are super easy to use and look really nice and really individual. And most importantly, will give you the ability to customize them. So you're presenting, you know, your own version of yourself. This is really cool one, like, like mouse is over like this. And these sorts of blogs will allow you to present yourself as yourself. Like I said, they have a bunch of free themes. The link is in the description below. And yes, there is a small cost for signing up with Ghost. However, like if you want to be able to really have a career, you are going to have to invest in yourself. And sometimes putting down just a little bit of money a month will be a good reminder for you to keep writing. And you know, if you start now, you're maybe say two to four months from actually getting your Salesforce administrator credential, maybe even shorter, if you write a couple of blog posts, by the time you're ready to start looking for a job, you will already have a couple of blog posts written and you could then keep on studying while you're looking for jobs, getting more experience, documenting that experience. I think that's really going to help set you apart. If you have questions about what to blog about, please ask them in the comment section or reach out to me on LinkedIn. So sign up with Ghost, start blogging on the things that you already know, keep blogging on the things that you're going to learn and come up with some of your own creative topics and solving real business problems. You'll stand out from the competition and be super set up when you're ready to start looking for your first 
Salesforce administrator job. Okay, so let's get to the super badge. So we're gonna talk about conversations, background documentation, user stories, what they are and why you should use them. And you might already be familiar with this, tasks, what they are and why you should use them as well. And a little bit about the pre-work and then we're gonna go out and actually create the user stories and the tasks. In this presentation, I'm going to make the user stories and tasks much more general than I did in the security specialist because I think I just really want people to see that you can organize the user stories in, in different ways and in different sizes and just get you thinking along those lines. So the background documentation should include the relevant conversations, business case information, technical information, and also the requirements. A user story is when a person says, as a blank, I want to do something so that, and then you give the reason why. This is a way of being able to take a general request uh, and put context on it. And this is super important because when we're talking about things in technology, I mean, most of these things weren't around five, 10 years ago even. So there's not necessarily a common language around what it is we're trying to accomplish. The tasks are the specific things that you need to do in order to complete the user story. And again, if you go through the same process and break up the super badge like I do in this video, you will have an amazing story to add to your blog. It will give you a tremendous lot more confidence in completing this uh, the super badge and that will just change your attitude when it actually comes time to start working. So this is partly why you super badges are so hard. It's because they're written in a way that you might have a conversation like Jeff Douglas mentioned on my other video. Like this is like way that people actually talk. Like I'm not actually gonna tell you the specific terms that are come up in the UI of the Salesforce interface. They're just gonna talk and you have to interpret what they're saying and find the right thing in Salesforce. The super badge has you go from the conversation straight to the task, you know, at, at one shot. And that's really confusing. And what I've tried to do is add in the, you know, the background information and the user stories. So it makes it a little bit more straightforward in terms of what it is that you're actually uh, doing here. The first thing you're gonna be doing that's part of the background is the pre-work. Uh, and you'll notice that I've put this up here. I've uh, you know basically identified which challenge is connected to this piece. So installing the package, importing the data, creating groups, that's all gonna be part of what you have to do for challenge two. So it makes it easy for you to come back and be like, okay, this is part of challenge two. By the way, in terms of the pre-work, I found uh, this add or edit pick list values document really helpful for installing the package and value solar bot to the type pick list on the opportunity object. So uh, do take a look at that. If you think about this entire huge long thing that we're doing, really all you're doing is setting up reports and dashboards for Ursa Major Solar's leadership of their different teams using solar bots data. That's pretty much it. Okay, again, more background documentation. These are the stakeholders that come up. There's the standard objects that are obviously the standard. And then there's the custom objects that they've added. The custom objects, I'll point this out as we get to it, but it gets a little confusing because sometimes you need to create a report or you have to do something on one of these two objects, but bring in data from the other one. And if you don't create it on the right one, it doesn't work. So it's important to keep in mind, like, you know, what's the solar bot object? What's the solar bot status object? And making sure that you're using those correctly. Okay, this is the en entity diagram. You know, there's, this is how things are related to each other. I just pulled this out of the schema builder, but I thought this was helpful to just get oriented a little bit. Okay, so folder administration. So this is gonna be part of challenge two. Keeping in mind that these are the, all the different report folders that you're gonna to need to create and how you're gonna go about creating them. So you're gonna have the executive folder, the sales folder, the support, the R&D, and this is the naming convention for how to do that. And you gotta make sure to do that correctly because if you don't, uh, it's not gonna be recognized. And also the status reports folder, important. This is not the way I originally did it, and the way the instructions, when it comes to folder administration, the way that they do this is 
reports and dashboard is this public group has access to all folders. And so then the structure of this, and this is like confusing to explain, the, their, the focus here is on the people, the public groups. That's the way that they presented it here. And that's actually the way that I originally tried to make this up was on the, on the people. But when it comes to actually doing the work and actually giving the sharing access, you actually give the sharing access on the folder level. So what I, I then did is I tried to break this up based off of the folder and to say which public group has access to manage editor view, which folder. And so then that makes it just a little bit more straightforward. I'm pretty sure that what I have in this piece of, when this document is correct, okay? Please do not spend two days thinking that I got this correct. You know, go back here, do your own work, break it up. I'm pretty sure that this is correct, but just don't bank on me and don't, you know, Re rely on yourself to decipher this and make your own and come to your own conclusions. This is the way I broke it up. I'm pretty sure that this is what I did to pass it. I'm not 100% sure. I might have made a mistake, but this framing will hopefully help you get this. Okay, enough disclaimers. All right. So this is how you're going to the sharing access for the executive folders, for the sales folder, for the support folder, and for the research and development folder. And that's it. Okay. You know how to pause the video, so go back and take a look at that. Help page access levels for report and dashboard folders was really helpful. I included a link to that in the description as well, so check that out. Okay, next part of challenge two is the report cleanup. You're gonna have to move reports in the acquisition reports folder to the appropriate folder based on the report name. That's a pretty straight folder. And place reports to delete in the reports recycle bin folder. Once you look into the package that you already installed, you'll see that there's some that are marked to delete. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, reporting on the custom object data. Here you're gonna label the solution. And they don't tell you what the solution is. They don't use the right word for a solution. But like usually I think of a solution as like a liquid of some sort, like, or the answer to a math problem, not a type of a report. But they don't wanna tell you what type of report it is because if they tell you what type of report it is, then they're gonna have basically given it away. Basically all I did was just take what was listed and try to break it up in a more digestible way. You could look this over on your own. That what was helpful here is the resources for completing challenge two. Some of these in here um, were super helpful. This video on use custom report types was super helpful. There is a part of this challenge where you have to do a drag and drop. I agonizingly was not able to complete that using Chrome or Microsoft Edge. I had to use Firefox. And this was just, I was, you know, this is part of the challenge. We have to drag from the left side, drop it on the right side, and I couldn't get that drop thing to work. I've logged a case with the tech team, like, and said like, hey, this is an issue, please fix it. Please, hopefully they will fix it. In the meantime, I just wanted to share that that was an issue that I ran across. I noticed that other people have this issue as well. The solution for me was using Firefox. I'm using a Mac. Maybe if you're on a PC, it's, it's different. And now we get into the building reports. And these are just gonna be building out all of these different reports. This, this has like so much extra information in here. It's so distracting, but it, that's just all they're trying to do. It's just trying to distract you. So keep that in mind. Try to break it out here that the sales team needs a report listing which customers to call to introduce uh, Ursa Major Solar to. Okay, they're a new, uh, they're new solar bot. Um, these are the things you're gonna do. This is the name that you have to give it. Um, and uh, yeah. The standard report type just means here, don't don't go thinking that you need to use a custom report that you just built because you just built that other report, right? Whatever that solution was. But you, you don't, you're just gonna be using one of the pre-made ones. It is a bit of a trick to think through what is the correct one to use. So when you do that though, and really for all of these reports, you just have to think about what is the primary object you are actually doing the report on. Is it the account, the case, the solar bot, something else? And once you think that through and you're like, okay, this is the report type I need, this is the object that I'm actually primarily using, it should go pretty smooth. 
Keep in mind, you can also use cross filters. So sometimes you're gonna be doing a report on one specific object, but pulling in data from a different place. And that's also an option that's available to you. Saying that that applies to this group page in particular, but into this group of reports, it does. Another thing to keep in mind is a lot of, when you start off with a report, it brings in a lot of extra fields. Only include the exact fields that are specified here. So when it says it should include uh, the account name, the account phone number, the customer type, um, that's, that's all the information you should include, okay? I think that's about all of the hints I could give you on that. Oh yeah, the, the account phone number, I don't know why, like sometimes I found that confusing because there's a bunch of different phone numbers that are included in the, in the list. Just make sure you're grabbing the account phone number. Okay, next sales report is the SolarBot High Case Candidates. So this is cool. SolarBot significantly improves the performance of solar panels. So you're gonna create a new report, the SolarBot High Case Candidates, and it's just gonna have exactly these things. And for all accounts that don't have any SolarBots, um, you're then gonna simplify the report and to help the sales team see which customers are best candidates for SolarBot, prioritize the list by the highest number of cases. So each one of these is basically saying there's a different task that you need to do for this and it's just talking about it in a very general way. Grouping by account should be pretty similar, easy to figure out. Also, just think about how to get the phone number to show up just once is also pretty straightforward. My mind went to like writing a formula, but it's like not that complicated. It's just clicking buttons. That's really all you gotta do. Sorting by the highest number is also pretty straightforward. That's also just clicking buttons. The piece at the end here about Maria added the roll-up summary field, okay? Maria, if you remember from the beginning, that was our Salesforce administrator. I'm pretty sure that that's added here just to say, don't be surprised when you see that. I don't think that that has anything that you actually have to do with it, but I'm not 100% sure. And then you're gonna save it in the right folder. And of course, making sure you save stuff in the right folder is essential because if it's not there, the trailhead won't be able to check the challenge. Also part of Challenge 3 SolarBot Warranty Call Sheet. This is actually really cool. I mean, you could create a new report for SolarBot Warranty Call Sheet and it's gonna have this inform you know, this bucket of information on it. I'm not gonna try to. So yeah, it's very straightforward. You're gonna keep users from adjusting the criteria that determines which accounts are shown. Again, that's a little bit, um, you know, the, the way that I would say this is keep in mind, you only want to show accounts that don't have warranties. And once you figure out how to do to do this, then there's a very simple way of preventing users from not doing it. I found this document, filter across objects with cross filters, very helpful in completing this challenge. So uh, do check that out. It's also linked in the description. At this point, we are on to the parts that connect to challenge four. We are now gonna start doing support reports. You can do the top case drivers by SolarBot ownership. I'll let you look through this on your own. I'll also add that there's two um, documents here that were pretty helpful for me. One was categorize data with bucket columns and also show and hide report details for this last part here, show individual cases, but not record totals. Moving along, the next support report you're gonna make is for the solar bot status averages. You know, the background information says that they have an issue where they can't see all required information on one record. So you're gonna create the solar bar status averages with this bunch of information. By the way, the word average here comes up a lot, but it's not necessarily in every single field that you're actually gonna be looking for. So don't don't get don't get overly distracted with that. Other word of caution I could give to you on this slide is that some of the fields, that there's a couple of fields here that sound similar to each other, but they're not exactly the same thing. So just you know, proceed with caution when you're picking out the right field and you're like, Jeff, how do you know that? I'll, well, because I found them, because I messed up, because I got it wrong and then I had to go back and do it again. Okay, now we're onto the background documentation relating to challenge five. This is about the re research and, and uh, development reports, R&D reports. All you need to show here is the average kilowatt hours and average panel temperature. That's really it. So you need to figure out some ways to remove the extra stuff. So all that shows up in the report is just those averages. And then, you know, grouped into those four categories as, as, uh, as specified. I mean, that's, I mean, this is 
this is what the, the background information says. Just, you know, this is all you want to show, but it's got to be grouped based off of uh, these things here. What in the world did that just happen? Moving on to the stuff that relates to challenge six, the executive report, implement the executive report. This phrase here, adjusted expected revenue, is a little bit confusing. You know, normally when you think of adjusting something, you think of like pulling your pants up, you know, because like you have to adjust them or like you have to adjust your seatbelt or something like that. You don't think of adjusting expected revenue, but it's just a bit of biz jargon that gets tossed around. And basically it means we're going to change the current state to something else based on an, an based on an anticipated outcome. That's all that that means. And so what we're trying to show here is that the currency value should be 10% higher at the subtotal and total levels if the account has at least one solar bot and the original value if not. Let me read that again, a little slower. This column should show a currency value 10% higher at the subtotal and total levels if the account has at least one solar bot and if not, show the original value. Just sort of rephrase things a little bit. You don't have to create any new fields. Uh, one thing I just want to mention is a, is a piece of math. I don't want to give anything away here. Okay, but the, the way that I would normally try to take a number and add on its percentage increase, the way I would typically do that, like in my before yesterday experience, <laughs> what I would have done is I'd take the number, I'd multiply it by the percentage, and then I'd add in the original number. So if I have, if I want to, take a hundred and I want to increase it by 20, what I would typically do by 20%, what I used to do is I would take a hundred times it by 20 and then add a hundred. Well, you don't have to do that because all you could do is you could just take a hundred and times it by 1.2 and then you will get the result of what a, a hundred plus 20% of a hundred is. To all of you math people out there, that might seem really intuitive. But to us liberal arts geeks, no, it wasn't intuitive at all. And so I did not give away the answer here, but hopefully that sent you on the right course to being able to figure out how to do something that is 10% higher because I did not share that specific one. Uh, finally on this, just this is a really cool report to do and it's a good report to include in a blog because this sort of information is so important at the executive levels, understanding where things are at their different stages is incredibly important. But before we move off of this, I just want to say that this help document was helpful for me. Evaluate group and totals with summary formulas. So uh, do check that out. Now we're going to do some updates to reports. This is part of relates to the background documentation for challenge seven. Update or, um, and organize the accounts without SolarBots opportunities report by billing state. You're going to expand the SolarBot warranty call sheet report to include customers with a SolarBot whose warranty expires in the next 45 days. And you're only going to include customers from Nevada, Utah, or California. And then finally here, the best practice for managing filters is to group similar items like warranty status or states together. I just want to say that the relative date filter this help doc came in really helpful for me for being able to figure out how to complete this. I actually had a lot of trouble in figuring out how to how to do this. It took me a long time. But the instructions, because I felt like there's a couple of ways of doing it, but there's actually, instructions are actually pretty clear here. The big clue is managing filters. And so um, I can't really share more than that other than to say like I lost an hour of my life trying to figure out how to make this work and it does at the end. So I guess that's what's important. And, and by the way, with all of these reports, all you have to do is just, if you try something and you're not sure if it works, just check challenge and it will tell you like if, you know, what's missing. And it, it checks each of the different steps in order. So if you get the feedback from checking those challenges is really helpful. Okay, this is the background documentation for support report modifications. I had to break this up into two pages because there's just so much here. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You have to think about um, relative proportion. So you're not looking, when we actually are looking at this graph, we actually don't, you actually don't want to see the actual numbers. You want to sort of see it so it's, they're relative to each other. And uh, that way you get a, a better sense. Okay, for the second part of the update to support reports, I'll just say that there's two, two sources that I thought were really helpful. One was 
another Salesforce support video, how to group reports by dates. So check that out. And then I also found an article on uh, the Salesforce Lightning record page that this was actually pretty helpful for me as well in being able to figure out how to complete uh, this part of the challenge. For the R&D report modifications, this is also pretty straightforward, but just keep in mind that when you're placing the categories in the x-axis with the count on the y-axis, you can adjust those like bar graphs show data one way and column graphs show data another way. And if you switch between those two, that's, that's how you can make that flip. Okay, now it's time to make the dashboard. You're on a challenge eight here. You're going to make a single dashboard that tracks the impact of the SolarBot acquisition on Ursa Major Solar. You're gonna name the dashboard SolarBot Impact Dashboard and save it in a new folder called SolarBot Dashboards. You're gonna to have to make this folder viewable by all internal users. There's actually a public group called all internal users. So that's 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 what you're looking for there. And uh, make reports and dashboard administrators managers of the folder. So the rule of sharing is the same as, as it started off with uh, using public groups. And that's just something to keep in mind. And now you actually have to go about and create these different components. So the first component is SolarBot pipeline by stage. Again, you can take this look, look this over. It's pretty straightforward. Second component is going to be case drivers and SolarBot ownership. The third component is the temperature and kilowatt hour relationship. And the key thing here is you have to make sure that each should have its own line. That's important. Fourth component is SolarBot Evangelism Countdown. Tracks progress toward the goal of all accounts having at least one SolarBot opportunity. So you have to think about, and this is really for this whole section, the tricky thing is, is to think about which report do I want to start with and then pull the right report. If you go back and you look at your reports and think about what your reports were trying to accomplish, then you'll understand which report to use to create each dashboard component. The green, yellow, red, that's not checked. You, I mean, if, um, if I recall, I recall having to change. It's like, it's not like there's not like a right red color, color that you have to get. Don't, don't, don't worry about that. Just make it look red and you'll be fine. The fifth component is opportunity overview. You have to include these, uh, this data. This is a big sort of like a chart thing that you've got going on that's going to be able to bring in all of that data. So you have to think about what's the component type that is going to allow you to show information by rows and columns. And then also you got to then color it and place it in the right spot. Just before we go off of this, make sure that you refresh before clicking check, check challenge, because if you don't, it might not recognize it. Finally, at the background documentation for part of challenge nine. Okay, this is like, Sita likes to use Daybreak. Okay, they're trying to tell you to use a specific color theme, okay? And they're just calling it Daybreak. But there's, there's a name for that that's in the UI and you have to think, boy, what does Daybreak sound like? And I totally didn't get this at first because I'm like, I, I don't know, I don't play around with the color themes. You have to dig into it and find them. And by the way, like at no point, I think in any of the requirements did we actually have to adjust the color of things. So now having to do this here was, it was, it was annoying. I was annoyed. Okay. I was annoyed. And I start like seeing like, like doing like this, like Talmudic thing, you know, like the only exception is the opportunity overview component, which should be fully light because these opportunities are so bright. So this one should be fully bright, which implies the other ones like should not be fully bright. Like, I mean, it's just, so therefore if they're not fully bright, they must be, you get it. It was aggravating. The second update, you wanna be able to look at marquee accounts for their pioneering use of solar. This help document was helpful, filter a dashboard. A after you add a filter a dashboard, you then have to check each component. There'll be a little thing I'm not going to give it away, but you will look at each component. There will be a new thing there and you will click that thing and confirm that it is correcting the selecting the right thing that you need to do in order for the component to be presenting correctly. Hopefully that was clear enough, but I, I don't want to like really give it away. But the third update is you have to add this SolarBot impact dashboard onto the SolarBot app page. So this goes back and brings up, you know, hopefully you remember doing 
the page layouts and you know going into the object and finding the page layout and adjusting it from there. So hopefully, hopefully that, that rings a bell. The next thing is the fourth update. You have a weekly meeting with the R&D team where you give updates on energy production. You have to sign up to receive the temperature report on Tuesday. And just make sure it's only Tuesday because by default, I think a couple of days were selected. So you just want that just to be Tuesday. And do be sure to turn this off when you complete this. Otherwise, you'll be getting for the rest of your life. That's all the background documentation. So like, where's the user stories? So I did here, as I said, the user stories are really straightforward. You're gonna organize and manage reports and folders. As a domain admin, I wanna organize reports. So all my teams have the organization, within the organization have easy access to the reports they need. And these are the reports you're gonna create. And so you're just, you know, chunking all of that information into one big, into one big uh, set of tasks. To set up the folder administration, you're gonna set up folder access for those different teams. You'll do report cleanup, you'll do report on custom object data. That's number two. You're then gonna build sales reports. For the sales team, you wanna review reports to focus the sales efforts. And you're gonna create these reports that are gonna go along with it. Next thing is you're gonna build support reports. That's the user story. So this, as a support team, I want to review reports to focus our support efforts. So we can decrease cases and provide better support. And you're gonna create these reports. That's it. Build R&D reports, straightforward. Executive reports, straightforward. Here's what you need to do. Here's why you need it. And you're gonna make the dashboard and you're gonna update the reports. That's it, you know? I mean, so what I did here, hopefully you saw that I, I broke the user stories into these much larger chunks. And that's a more realistic way of actually coming across user stories when you actually see them in real life. You know, it's just a, and then you'll, reference back to the background, background documentation to be able to get that done. I hope you found this video helpful. Reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm always happy to answer anything for you. I really do feel very grateful that I get to be just a small part of your experience and journey in learning Salesforce. Thanks so much for watching. You thought it was over. I should mention that like once you complete the super badge, you then have to make sure if you don't do it right then, you have to go back into your hands-on orgs, launch your super badge trailhead playground, go into your reports, go into your temperature to kilowatt hours report here and say, click on the subscribe button and say unsubscribe. Yes, I am sure I want to unsubscribe. And now we're really done.